Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this series is one entitled, Rest in Christ. And this lesson is entitled, Free to Rest. It's Lesson 8 for August 21 of 2021. And as usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Father, we come before you now recognizing your presence with us, but especially asking for your guidance as we today study this lesson about healing and all that it implies from the stories in the Bible. May these two stories bring us closer to you and help us to not make the mistakes that some made, but yet do the things which you would want us to do in light of your power and your forgiveness is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't need to tell you, if you're a Christian of any kind, that there are a lot of healing stories in the Bible. No doubt there were thousands of people who came from every direction to be healed by Jesus. And why would that be? Jim? Mark 3, verses 7 and 8. Jesus and his disciples went away to Lake Galilee, and a large crowd followed him. They had come from Galilee, from Judea, from Jerusalem, from the territory of Edomia. Okay, let's stop for a second. Where is Edomia? That's to the east across the it's Jordan, Jordan, isn't it? It's on the other, but it's even further south than, than Judea. It's, that's the territory. It goes, for, it goes further on down. So we're talking a long way. We're talking people who walked 100 miles to see Jesus. Oh. Okay. Go ahead. From the territory on the east side of the Jordan. Now that would be now the territory we call Jordan. Go ahead. Was well, that Petra, isn't it? Wouldn't that be part of Edomia? Edomia, yes. Okay. Uh, from the territory on the east side of the Jordan and from the region around the cities of Tyre and Sidon. So the people came from many, many miles to the northeast and northwest, way in Lebanon now. Yeah. Okay. All these people came to Jesus because they had heard of the things he had, was doing, American Bible Society, 1992. Now, think about our society today. What do the young people go to see? Rock concerts. What, how would different would our society be if the most incredible thing that was happening, the thing that the young people went to see, was Jesus? Well, one thing, there's, with the rock concert, there's not a whole lot of serious thinking going no. on. No. A lot of cacophony, you know, but uh, with, with Jesus, uh, the message he had and the, and the healing, the healing got their attention, but uh, yeah. they, they had some words to... Well, with creative power, Jesus could have healed many, many people with a single word. He often did that. Sometimes he touched people. Sometimes he sent them off to be healed on the way or even to be going, even by going to the pool of Siloam and washing. He healed all sorts of people, men and women and children and Jews and Gentiles, rich people, poor people, unassuming people. I mean, think of all the people that Jesus healed. He even chose to raise people from the dead. As we have noted in previous lessons, he even gave his disciples the power to raise people from the dead. Now, if you were sick from anywhere in a 200 mile region of, the, of where Jesus was, where would you want to get to? I mean, is there anybody else offering, you know, offering to raise people from the dead? Just for an example? Nobody. Jesus lived in a country where there were no hospitals and where the priests were often the ones expected to try to help the sick. And basically what they would do, they didn't offer any medicines or anything. They just, well, you look healthy to me or you look sick. And you, you, you're, you're, if, if you, they say you got leprosy, for example, you're condemned to a life of, of horror. And you have no option of responding. There's no, well, I don't like, I don't want a second opinion. None of that kind of stuff. Okay, Carrie. Uh, the people of Nazareth knew that he went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed by Satan. About them were whole villages where... Now, that's were, what I wanted to notice here. Whole uh, villages where there was not a moan of sickness in any house. 
for he had passed through them and healed all their sick. The mercy revealed in every act of his life testified to his divine anointing, and that comes from the Desire of Ages, page 241, paragraph 1. Now, if you were sick and Jesus came through town, what would you want to do? <laughs> Gotta go see that guy. I know. Wow. Even if he's not near you, I gotta, I gotta get, to get someone to take me there. Yeah. This lesson will consider two very different examples of healing. In our first case, we see Jesus dealing with an individual who was so ill that he was near death. In our second case, it was not obvious to an observer that he was sick at all. Try to imagine what would have what would happen even in our day to have Jesus walk into a large hospital and heal everyone. I've sometimes asked my Sabbath school class, okay, here we are at Loma Linda, there's this huge medical center here. What would happen if, you, if Jesus walked in one day, or even somebody with miraculous powers, and healed every single person in the hospital? How would it get reported in the newspaper? Revenues would go down for about six hours, and then they would be overwhelmed. Yeah. Everyone would be discharged, and then... Well, they would, they would walk and out. And everyone would come. And then everyone would come. That's exactly right. Wow. And I wonder, I mean, if Jesus really did it, how would our newspapers day today report it? Ever tried to think about that? Hmm. Well, for sure, in Jesus' day, he was the only one in the world, in the whole world, who had that kind of power. There were no scientifically trained doctors with our medicines to help. During this quarter, we have been discussing rest and its implications. When someone is sick, sometimes she or he needs rest most of all. There are also many people who need mental rest, rest from all kinds of mental problems. Sometimes those problems are, all, are relatively minor, but sometimes they can be life-threatening. People may have trouble sleeping because they are afraid they will not wake up. I don't know, those of you who have some medical experience, have you ever talked to a patient who is afraid to go to sleep because he won't wake up? There are yeah. a few people with strokes or lesions in an area called on, on Dean's Curse, mm -hmm. where they can only breathe when they are actually thinking of it. There's no involuntary, no subconscious breathing. Oh boy. So literally, they do, if they go to sleep, they do die. Can they, well, you I mean, obviously you'd have to connect them up to a CPAP, but yeah, have, have to, have it wouldn't be a regular CPAP. Yeah. yeah, it had to be a- Almost have to have daytime breathing too. Yeah, wow. They may be wondering about earlier times in their life when they were doing unsafe things or very unholy things. They may be concerned about their current lifestyle. Some might even be worried about God punishing them. To introduce our first story this week, look at Mark 2, verses 1 to 4. A few days later, Jesus went back to Capernaum, and the news spread that he was at home. So many people came together that there was no room left, not even in the front of the door, Out, not even out in front of the door. Jesus was preaching the message to them when four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man to Jesus. Because of the crowd, however, they could not get, to the, get the man to him. So they made a hole in the roof right above the place where Jesus was. Then they made, when they had made the opening, they let the man down, lifting, lying on his mat. Wow. <laughs> so this was not a roof like our roof, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, kind of a thatch roof, apparently. Well, it was, they had flat roofs. They probably had boards lying on larger timbers, and they probably were able to, and then there would have been some kind of material on top of that, maybe, you know, grass or whatever, and they probably had to take the grass off and move some of the boards, and then there would probably be a gap in the, in the, in the larger timbers supporting the roof, and they could let somebody down through that. I'm, I'm, I'm not a, a, a Near Eastern, you know, <laughs> carpenter or, or builder, but something like that. Well, there was no question in the mind of that sufferer that he needed help. 
Ellen White gives it considerable detail about his background, and I really, if you're interested, if you're interested in this Sabbath school lesson, or you especially if you're planning to teach this lesson, go to Desire of Ages and read 271, 267, I'm sorry, to 271. And we'll give you a few high highlights from those passages. This particular patient had caused his illness, and thus he feared that there was no cure. Notice these important points from Ellen White's comments. And again, this is from Desire of Ages. Like the leper, this paralytic had lost all hope of recovery. His disease was the result of a life of sin, and his sufferings were embittered by, remote, by remorse. He had long before appealed to the Pharisees and doctors, hoping for relief from mental suffering and physical pain. But they coldly pronounced him incurable and abandoned him to the wrath of God. Interesting term. The Pharisees <laughs> regarded affliction as an evidence of divine displeasure, and they held themselves aloof from the sick and the needy. Yet often these very ones who exalted themselves as a holy were more guilty than the sufferers they condemned. Okay, let's hold on here for a second. If, if they had that attitude towards sin as being the direct cause of, of, of um, sickness, and they knew what, even that they got out of this guy the story of how he had gotten sick and what his sins were, what would you say? Well, you got what you deserved, right? That's I mean, right. what else could you say if you really believe like that? We know that sin causes sickness, or mm -hmm. sickness is caused by sin. You're a sinner. We know what happened. We know, we know the cause and effect. Right. Back to Desire of Ages. The palsied man was entirely helpless, and seeing no prospect of aid from any quarter, he had sunk into despair. Wonder why. <laughs> then he heard of the wonderful works of Jesus. He was told that others, as sinful and helpless as he, had been healed. Even lepers had been cleansed. And the friends who reported these things encouraged him to believe that he, too, might be cured if he could be carried to Jesus. But his hope fell when he remembered how the disease had been brought upon him. He feared that the pure physician would not tolerate him in his presence. Makes you wonder what this disease was. Was it yeah. syphilis, syphilis? Tertiary syphilis? Could have been. Fell off too. Yeah. Oh. Yet, in, yet it was not his physical restoration he desired so much as relief from the burden of sin. If he could see Jesus and receive the assurance of forgiveness and peace with heaven, he would be content to live or die according to God's will. The cry of the dying man was, Oh, that I might come into his presence. There was no time to lose. Already his wasted flesh was showing signs of decay. He besought his friends to carry him on the bed to Jesus, and this they gladly undertook to do. But, no, but so dense was the crowd that, <clears throat> that had assembled in and about the house where, Jesus, where the Savior was, that it was impossible for the sick man and his friends to reach him, or even to come within hearing of his voice. Jesus was teaching in the house of Peter. According to their custom, his disciples sat close about him, <clears throat> and there were Pharisees and doctors of the law sitting by, which were come out of, the, of every town of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem. These had come as spies, seeking an accusation against Jesus. So imagine everything you do all day long, you're trying to help people, and you're constantly surrounded by people who are just looking for anything that you might say or do that they could use to accuse you. So the disciples are close by, mm -hmm. then the Pharisees, and outside of that are the people that Jesus was trying to reach, other than yeah. the disciples. Back to Desire of Ages. <clears throat> the Savior looked upon the, mour the mournful countenance and saw the pleading eyes fixed upon him. He understood the case. He had drawn to himself that perplexed and doubting spirit. While the paralytic was yet at home, the Savior had brought conviction to his conscience. Think so, about that. So the Savior, Jesus, knew that this man wanted to come and was coming. Yeah. Uh, 
it's amazing. Back to Desire of Ages. When he repented of his sins and believed in the power of Jesus to make him whole, the life-giving miracles of the Savior had first blessed, the, blessed his longing heart. <clears throat> Jesus had watched the first glimmer of faith grow into a belief that he was the sinner's only helper and he had seen it grow stronger and with every effort to come into his presence. Now in words that fell like music on the sufferer's ear, the Savior said, Son, be of good cheer. Thy sins be forgiven thee. Now I, I love this, what Jesus did here. Obviously he knew exactly what he was doing. And basically their mistaken beliefs about the relationship between sin and his sickness placed them where Jesus could... I mean, they, 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 they made a trap for Jesus and they fell into the trap themselves. <laughs> it was... Anyway, go ahead. Desire of Ages again. The rabbis had waited anxiously to see what disposition Christ would make of this case. They recollected how the man had appealed to them for help and they had refused him hope or sympathy. Not satisfied with this, they had declared that he was suffering the curse of God for his sins. <laughs> These things came fresh to their minds when they saw the sick man before them. They marked the, they marked the interest with which all were watching the scene, and they felt a terrible fear of losing their own influence over the people. It required nothing less than creative power to restore health to that decaying body. The same voice that spoke life to man, created from the dust of the earth, had spoken life to the dying paralytic, and the same power that gave life to the body had renewed the heart. The paralytic found in Christ healing for both the soul and the body. The spiritual healing was followed by physical restoration. This lesson should not be overlooked. Today are thousands, there are today thousands suffering from physical disease who, like the paralytic, are longing for the message Thy sins are forgiven. The now, do we, in our, in our work as physicians, how do we implement that? I don't recall ever saying to someone, thy sins are forgiven, or your you sins are forgiven. You haven't said that? I have not. <laughs> so how maybe, are we maybe supposed I should have. How, how, how are we supposed to implement these ideas? God has forgiven you. If that's okay. what they need to hear, that's what we should tell them, perhaps. Okay. And pray with them. Pray with them, yes. If Pharisees I... and Jews had been doing what God originally intended, they might have been doing some of that and not him. And I can tell you, if you, if you treat people well, I mean, even just you know, the best you can, yeah. you, can't macro, you can't miraculously heal them. I mean, just this morning, I heard a report of, of the clinic that we started what, more than 25 years ago with four of us working there, they're in, it's now a $70 million business that so we're just getting ready. We can't handle all the work. They, they're asking us to build new clinics and new places and asking us to put up new buildings where we already have buildings. I mean, you know, that's the same kind of thing. I mean, people, if you, even our simple things that we do, if you do it, reasonably well and you care about people and you do it in the right kind of setting, I mean, people are banging the doors down. And that's a clinic for the underserved populations yeah. of the area. Yeah, exactly. Returning to Desire of Ages, the burden of sin with its unrest and unsatisfied desires is the foundation of their maladies. They can find no relief until they come to the healer of the soul. The peace which he alone can give would impart vigor to the mind and health to the body. Ellen White, Desire of Ages, page 267 through 270. While well, this young man probably had some idea about why he was sick, trying to assign blame would never make him better. Of course, God's original plan for the human race was to live perfectly healthy lives in the Garden of Eden. God has a plan to restore that condition when the time comes, as we know. Hopefully soon. Yes, but today, no matter how carefully we may live, we will end up with one or more health problems, finally ending up dying if that occurs before the second coming of Christ. You know, like they used to, one, I saw one uh, card that said, the death rate is the same as it always has been. 
one per person. <laughs> <laughs> There's always somebody. <laughs> well, the Christian, of course, came, can look forward to a perfect life in the future. Even if he dies in this world, God promises real and ultimate rest to his faithful children. In our day, when we have a clear idea of what causes many diseases, it may be helpful to know what those causes are. But in the days of Jesus, little was known about the causes of disease, and knowing the cause usually did not result in a treatment. I mean, you can say, okay, you got this, or you got this, or you did this. Okay, so what? What difference does that make if there's nothing that you can do about it? Well, if your health was shot, yeah. and your economics was not there working, mm -hmm. you must be done something to offend the, the deity. Mm -hmm. Well, a part of the roof of Peter's house, why do we know that it was Peter's house? Because the Bible said so, didn't it? No, the Bible doesn't say Ellen so. White says it so. The Bible implies it, and Ella White specifically says it. A part of the roof of Peter's house had been torn out so his friends could lower this seriously ill young man down right in front of Jesus. He really wondered what Jesus would say about his previous sin and his illness. So, Mark 2, 5 through 12. Seeing how much faith they had, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, My son, your sins are forgiven. So who are the they? The people who carried him there. The people who carried him there. Some teachers of the law who were sitting there thought to themselves, thought to themselves. They didn't say anything out loud. How does he dare to talk like this? This is blasphemy. I mean, you could almost hear them smiling. We've got him this time. Blasphemy. God is the only one who can forgive sins. At once, Jesus knew what they were thinking. I mean, you know, <laughs> you would think after a while these guys would say, we shouldn't, even be, don't, we shouldn't even try to touch this guy because every time we try, we get ourselves into trouble. So Jesus knew what they were thinking, so he said to them, why do you think such things? And I remember when I was younger, I read this story. This doesn't make any sense. What, what do they mean? You know, what? And then I, when I found out that what they're thinking was about sin and disease and how it happened, oh, now I understand why Jesus did that. Why do they think such? Th why do you think such things? Is it easier to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven? which they thought was the cause of his disease, or to say, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. And so in their, in their way of thinking, if you did one, either one, you, you would have to do both. You couldn't, you couldn't make the guy well so he walks out of the place without healing his sins because it's his sins which causes the problem, right? I will prove to you then that the Son of Man, this human being, has authority on earth to forgive sins. So what is he really saying? I am God. God. Oh dear me, I am oh, God. A can of worms. So he said, <laughs> it was more than a can of worms. Yeah. So he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, pick up your mat and go home. And I can hear the, see the Pharisees going, oh, 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 I, I think he's gonna, he's gonna do it. Not again. <laughs> I wonder if they had a front row seat to, to see all of this stuff. Yeah, well, well uh, as we read earlier, there were the Jesus the and the disciples yeah. nearby, and then the Pharisees. Yeah. And well, they got a ticket to get, to get in there. <laughs> front row seats. Yeah, while they all watched, the man got up, picked up his mat, and hurried away. I've, I've often, I, I'm always a little curious about this, but you understand what comes next. They were all completely amazed and praised God, saying, we've never seen anything like this. And if you read on, it says, the crowd sort of just melted away as they saw him coming. I mean, the, were they afraid to touch him? <laughs> if, if that was me that got healed, I would think I would stay there and say, oh, this man healed me. Let's, yeah. let's get more. Yeah. But Jesus, sometimes he says, hey, don't tell anybody about this. Yeah. Right. You know. but, but the Pharisees were all around him. Yeah. Once we are unaware of the onset of a, often we are unaware of the onset of a disease. Yeah. 
Many infectious diseases, especially viral diseases, may attack our bodies and we can even spread them to other people before we know that we're sick. We call that, what do we call that? The incubation period, right? Yeah. Yeah. Furthermore, we often think that getting rid of the symptoms means healing. But Jesus took a different approach to disease. He knew, and he still knows, that the very root of all disease is sin. He also realized, as we have already noted, that this man was desperately hoping for forgiveness from his previously sinful life. So if the root of all disease is sin, then the Pharisees were right. Yeah. Well, okay, but there's the fact there's that is, it, huh? is the, the fact that it's the root doesn't mean that if you just try to attack the root, you're gonna, the problem's going to go away. They were partially right, huh? Yeah. Well, we all would agree that there was no problem until sin came along. The Pharisees were just waiting for Jesus to do or say something that they could use against him. And then he just, I mean, you know, like standing there and saying, guess what? I'm God. Uh, did you, <laughs> you know? Like an expert on chess, he knew which one to move. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But he did not let them prevent him from going straight to the root of the problem. Jesus offered him the forgiveness he so longed for. Reading again, Mark 2, 8 and 9. At once, Jesus knew that they, that, that is the Pharisees, were thinking. Oh, excuse me, what they were thinking. Uh, so he said to them, why do you think such things? It is, is it easier to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, pick up your bed, pick up your mat and walk? Good news, Bible. It's very important for us to understand this, this event, to remember that the one who chose to forgive and heal this young man was the creator of our universe. Furthermore, God is forgiveness personified. Jesus demonstrated that by forgiving the men who are nailing him to the cross, and our verse which we talked about last week. I'm reading uh, from the book of Luke, chapter 23, verse 34. Jesus said, forgive them, Father, they don't know what they are doing. Came from the Good News Bible. God will always choose to heal the inside first. But as we know, that often brought and brings healing of the physical as being as well. Yeah. We cool. also know that every believing Christian who chooses God as his guide and protector will eventually be 100% perfectly healed. Perhaps not in this life, but in the life to come. Myra? <clears throat> Based on the data from the World Health Organization, the most common illness worldwide, affecting more than 300 million people each year, does not always have, an obvious, have obvious visible symptoms. Depression is the leading cause of disability worldwide and is a major contributor to the global burden of disease from the Adult Sabbath School study guide. I tried to look this information up. I couldn't find it. Um, there's several parts of this thing, and I don't think it follows logically through this. It seems to imply that, um, that there are just millions of people who have this disease. There are. But are they saying the millions of people who... The, it, later it says disease, depression is the leading cause of disability. Is it only talking about people who are disabled? I'm not sure. Depression clearly is a very yeah. serious problem and yeah. very uh, worldwide, yeah. not just in our country. As Christians, we are sometimes reluctant to even talk about depression. We tend to think that a Bible-believing Christian should not get depressed. Would depression mean that there was something wrong with our relationship with God? From Ellen White, Testimonies for the Church, Volume 3, page 183. A great deal of sickness that afflicts humanity has its origin in the mind and can only be cured by restoring the mind to health. There are very many more than we imagine who are sick mentally. Heart sickness makes many dyspeptics. 
for mental health has a paralyzing influence upon the digestive organs. So this was written long before yep. modern medicine realized that, wasn't yep. it? Long, this, this would, would have been, I should have put the actual date in there. This was written about uh, probably in the 1860s, in the middle of the, the Civil War. Yeah. Do you want me to continue? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, this from Testimonies for the Church, Volume 4, page 578. The managers of the sanitarium may as well conclude at once that they will never be able to satisfy that class of minds that can find happiness only in something new and exciting. To many persons, this has been the intellectual diet during their lifetime. There are mental as well as physical dyslep dyspeptics. Dyspeptics isn't a common word in our vocabulary, yeah. is it? Yeah. Many are suffering from maladies of the soul far more than from diseases of the body, and they will find no relief until they, come to sh until they shall come to Christ, the wellspring of life. Complaints of weariness, lowliness, and dissatisfaction will then cease. Satisfying joys will give vigor to the mind and health to the vital organs of the body, vital energy to the body. I have a... So what is dyspe dyspe dyspepsia? Dyspepsia is a, a, a general term for upset. started out mean, meaning upset of the stomach, upset stomach. Yeah. Um, I have a very... Story, an interesting story, a, a patient that I know, a, a beautiful young woman actually, very, quite young, um, busy doing all kinds of stuff. She, she, she works at home, um, writing some books she hopes will be famous someday. But she has, she has, she's being treated for depression, she's been treating, she's being treated for pains and so forth like this, all that kind of stuff. And then one day she got a boyfriend. And she didn't need her pain medicine anymore. She didn't need her depression medicine anymore. And then she lost the boyfriend, and now she needs her pain medicine and her her her, her depression medicine again. So I mean that that's a very simple example. But I mean, think what God can do for you if you really trust in Him. And that's just a very simple. And what do you God can do for you if you, what do you do if you have a false concept of God? Yeah. You have, have, read someplace back about 2003, somewhere in that vintage, there were about 33,000 Christian religions. Mm. Within the last few years, it was about up to 45,000 Christian religions. Now, can, what percentage of those are right? Yeah. yeah. Close to zero. False concept of God is, uh, and in, in the way the Bible is presented with a lot of people, it, it, you have a schizophrenic God. People yeah. say, oh, I like the God of the New Testament, but that Old Testament God, I, I have no use for him. I'm yeah. just, so. Well, go ahead. Uh, another quote from Ministry of Healing, page 241. Courage, hope, no, I'm sorry, a paragraph. Disease is sometimes produced and is often greatly exaggerated by the Aggravate. imagination. Aggravated. Aggravated by the imagination. Many are lifelong invalids who might be well if they only thought so. Many imagine that every slight exposure will cause illness, and the evil effect is produced because it is expected. Many die from disease, the cause of which is wholly imaginary. Hmm. Courage, hope, faith, sympathy, love, promote health, and prolong life. A contented mind... A cheerful spirit is health to the body and strength to the soul. A, a merry, rejoicing heart doeth good like a medicine. Proverbs 17:22. In the treatment of the sick, the effect of mental influence should not be overlooked. Rightly used, this influence affords one of the most effective agencies for combating disease. Again, that's from Ministry of Healing. And one short paragraph from Testimonies for the Church, Volume 6. Page 301, to take people right where they are, whatever their position or condition, and help them in every way possible, this is gospel ministry. Those who are diseased in mind are nearly always diseased. Uh, diseased in me, body. Those who are diseased in body are nearly always diseased in mind. And when the soul is sick, the body also is afflicted. Yeah. 
Okay, Testimonies, Volume 6, like you said. Depression often sneaks up on people. It may drain a person completely emotionally and even physically. Think of all the ways people respond to depression. Some people turn to the refrigerator and try to eat themselves happy again. I knew a person, a young lady, who she would get depressed and she would solve it by trying to eat a half gallon of ice cream nonstop. Yeah. It helps me. Yeah. <laughs> I remember a, fe a young female patient, I won't say where, but it was in California, and she kept coming back into the place. She'd get a, even that and she'd be back. And she came from a very good family. Her father was a, a, one of the presidents, had been given a job overseas, and while the people were having their parties, the kids were raiding the booze. And I said to her one day, I said, you've had good education and everything. Oh, why do you do it? She says, Kerry, I live for the present. Yeah. That was her whole life. Hmm. Sometimes a person looks to new relationships, a new job, or a new location to deal with the depression. Others try to bury themselves in their work. Others use medications which may or may not help. And there are some pretty good medicines now we can be thankful for. Yeah. Now consider the story of God's faithful prophet Elijah after that incredible experience on Mount Carmel. I wish we had time to go through all the details of that. You remember that was a three and a half year uh, drought and then God said to Elijah, go back and tell them, okay, we're ready, to, we're ready to, to end the drought, call the people up to Mount Carmel, you know, set up this deal, let the people, the worshipers of Baal, build their altar, you build a, an altar to God, and we'll see what happens. And you know, that the, the people from, and the, the idea was that the God who was really God would be the one who responded with fire from heaven. And I mean, try to imagine, these guys are jumping and shouting around and trying to see if they can figure out a way to slip fire in there. And I'm sure that even if they tried to slip fire in, fire in there, God would not have allowed it to ignite. And then, fortunately, and, they didn't have lighters back in those days. Yeah, fortunately. <laughs> Cigarette lighters. And then finally, when, when Eli came, Elisha's turn, he said, pour water on it. We want to make sure there's no hanky-panky going on here and so forth and then he just knelt down and prayed to God and there was that lightning came from heaven consumed the offering and the the wire the, the wood and the the stones and left a black hole in the ground I mean would you run what would you do if you saw something like that amazing well at the end of that what happened first Kings 1840 Elijah ordered seize the prophets of Baal. Remember he had said, if Baal is God, then follow him. If Yahweh is God, then follow him. And then he said, seize the prophets of Baal. Don't let any of them get away. The people seized them all, and Elijah led them down to the river Kishon and killed them. And is there a passage where it says, well done, uh, Elijah? No, there's not that passage right there. And and, and, well, and then a uh, short time after that, he, Elijah has to run, run from Jezebel, doesn't he? Yeah. yeah. And we're going to talk about it in a moment. In addition to having that incredible experience on the top of Mount Carmel and supervising or maybe even participating in the killing of 850 of the prophets of Baal and Asherah, Elijah had essentially run a marathon guiding the king back to his home. Remember, he had to run in, in front of the the king's chariot because the, the, it was raining so hard he couldn't see where he was going. And what happened next? Reading from 1 Kings 19 verses 1 through 5. King Ahab told his wife Jezebel everything that Elijah had done and how he had put all the prophets of Baal to death. She sent a message to Elijah, May the God strike me dead if by this time tomorrow I don't do the same thing to you that you did to the prophets. Elijah was afraid and fled for his life. He took his servant and went to Beersheba in Judah. Okay, now I'm going to interrupt there for a second. What do we know about Jezebel's background? Her father was a priest of Baal. Her father was the head priest of Baal over in Sidon. 
and she was a priestess of Baal. So she came with all these prophets of hers to evangelize Israel. That was her goal. These guys obviously were obviously very confident in her yeah. God. Yeah. To to go to Elijah, to send the message to Elijah, you know, tomorrow, after he had just killed 850. Her evangelists. Uh, okay, Carrie. Leaving the servant there, Elijah walked a whole day into the wilderness. He stopped and sat down in the shade of a tree and wished he would die. It's too much, Lord, he prayed. Take away my life. I might as well be dead. He lay down under the tree and fell asleep. Suddenly an angel touched him and said, Wake up and eat. From the Good News Bible. When the word came to Elijah, sleeping outside the capital city of Ahab and Jezebel in the pouring rain, I hope he found at least a little bit of shelter from the rain, um, he began to run again. But as he ran, he prayed. What a difference between his previous prayer on Mount Carmel and this one. On Mount Carmel, he prayed, Myra? From 1 Kings 18, 36 and 37. At the hour of the afternoon sacrifice, the prophet Elijah approached the altar and prayed, O Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, prove now that you are the God of Israel and that I am your servant and have done all this at your command. Answer me, Lord, answer me, so that the this people will know that you, the Lord, are God, and that you are bringing them back to yourself. Good News Bible. Okay, after Elijah found that Jezebel was trying to kill him, and as we read, early, as we read earlier, 1 Kings 19.4, Elijah walked a whole day into the wilderness. He stopped and sat down in the shade of tree and wished he would die. It's too much, Lord, he prayed. Take away my life. I might as well be dead. Well, it is a well-known fact that people who experience real emotional highs are often liable to emotional cra crashes. That's what uh, he had. Yep. A famous Adventist evangelist that I know about would sometimes take one to two weeks of quiet time after a particularly successful evangelistic series in order to prevent this problem. Elijah recognized that instead of running, he should have stayed and followed up on that wonderful opportunity. I mean, he should have gone around and said, you people, do you made a decision. You said, worship God. Okay, what does that mean? How can we clean up this mess? Instead, what's he doing? Believing. He found himself far away in a different country, wishing he could die. Elijah was beginning to experience self-revelation. That can be painful. Have you ever had a painful experience of self-revelation? Consider these words from Paul found in Philippians 3.9. And be completely united with him, that is with God. I no longer have a righteousness of my own, the kind that is gained by obeying the law. I now have the righteousness that is given to faith in Christ. The righteousness that comes from God and is based on faith. In light of Elijah's running away from his responsibilities, should God have just abandoned him? God does not do that. God understands our thinking even better than we do. Jim? We may have no remarkable evidence at the time that the face of our Redeemer is bending over us in compassion and love, but this is even so. We may not feel his visible touch but his hand is upon us in love and pitying tenderness. Ellen White, Steps to Christ, pages 96 and 97. Sometimes God, knowing what we were going through, lets us hit bottom before we fully realize our great need. There are many promises in the Bible that should come to our minds on such occasions. And I have just picked like one of, there's many of them in our Bible study guide, but go ahead, carry just that one. Psalms 34, 18. The Lord is near to those who are discouraged. He saves those who have lost all hope. This is from the Good News Bible. 
So instead of condemning Elijah, God fed him with miraculous food that made it possible for him to travel for 40 days without any further food. One might think that this would be the end of the story, but it was not. And what about water? Did he travel those 40 days without water too? This oh. was in the area where Mount Zion. the Israelites had the, had the rock give them water. Maybe yeah. God gave him water that way. It could be. Finally, Elijah found himself in a cave on the side of Mount Sinai. He was resting and hiding. I do not know if he still thought that Jezebel could find him there, but there, were, there he was. Then God called him to the mouth of the cave where he experienced wind, earthquake, and fire. And you would think, you know, whew, here's the wind and it's blowing rocks around and here's the earthquake and, you know, you're running. You don't know whether to run back into the cave or to run out of the cave. As a, and then fire, whoa. I mean, surely you would say, wow, God is really in all those things. And what did he find? First Kings nineteen twelve. After the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. After the fire, there was a soft whisper of a voice. King James, or er, the, the Good News the, Bible. The creator of the universe speaks in what kind of voice? A whisper. whisper. Soft whisper. God is not in the wind, the earthquake, or fire. Those are many times called uh, acts of God, aren't yes. they? By insurance yeah. policies? Yes. Yeah, so the, what does the soft whisper of a voice mean? Is that, um, is that the I, voice of reason and, and yeah. let's come and think together and read yep. the Bible and so on? Is that what yep. it means? Yeah. Uh, I'm trying to remember. There's one, one scholar that I heard not in a biblical translation, but he said, it's the, the, the quiet sound of silence or something. Is what small he, silence or something, that I remember. Yeah, yeah, small silence. But we find that God still had some very important plans for Elijah. First Kings 19, verses 15 and 16. The Lord said, return to the wilderness where, uh, near Damascus. Now, how far is that from where he is? Long ways. A long ways. Damascus hundreds, hundreds is of miles, isn't hundreds it? of miles, all the way through Judah, all the way through Galilee or Israel in those days, all the way beyond that in, up into Syria. Then enter the city and anoint Haziel as king of Syria. Anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, as the king of Israel. And anoint Elisha, son of uh, Sh Shepat, from Abel Meholah. Abel Mahola to succeed you as prophet. So he's anointing people, king here, king there, and a prophet. I mean, what happens if a stranger from another country you've never seen before walks into the city and says, I'm anointing you king? Oh, yeah? <laughs> and you're going to be my successor. Yeah. I'm sorry, but I don't want to be. <laughs> God wanted Elijah to train his successor, Elisha. And Elijah was not even finished calling down fire from heaven. Second Kings 1.10. Sometime later, we can add, if, a man of, if, I, if I am a man of God, Elijah answered, may fire come down from heaven and kill you and your men. At once fire, fire came down and killed the officer and his men. And again, as Jim said, does it say right after that, well done, Elijah? Did God say he, that? Yet he was taken to heaven. Soon, yeah. very soon. So what after. does that tell us about in, in God? In a chariot of fire. Yeah, what does it tell us about God? <laughs> yeah. God is far more gracious than we can imagine. Yeah. From these two stories, one, the, the healing of Je by Jesus of the paralyzed man, and two, Elijah, we should be able to recognize that with God on our side, we must never give up. Okay, with the continual change of circumstances, changes come in our experience. And by these changes, we are either elated or depressed. But the change of circumstances has no power to change God's relation to us. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he asks us to have unquestioning confidence in his love. In Heavenly Places, page 120, paragraph 4. Keep, keep looking unto Jesus, offering up silent prayers in faith taking hold of his strength, whether you have any manifest, manifest feeling or not, God, right forward, go right forward, as if every prayer offered was lodged at the throne of God and responded to by the one whose promises never fail. 
Go right along, singing and making melody to God in your hearts, even when depressed by a sense of weight and sadness. I tell you, as one who knows, light will come, joy will be ours, and the mist and clouds will be rolled back, and we pass from the oppressive power of the shadow and darkness into the clear sunshine of His presence. Select the message is Book 2, 242 and 243. So how should we as Christians and especially as church groups relate to those who may be suffering with depression? What should we do to support them and, and help them? Sometimes, as if it, sometimes it is difficult to be honest and truthful in dealing with such problems, especially things like depression. It is important to recognize that faith is not feeling. Someone might be depressed, discouraged, fearful, even worried, but that does not mean that they do not have faith in God. And we must not let those feelings distract us from our relationship with God. As Jim already said a little while ago, this same guy who was so depressed ended up going to heaven in a chariot of fire. The Jewish leaders, especially the Pharisees, by their thinking, had set themselves up for a real problem when facing Jesus. Today we recognize that sin and forgiveness are one side of the issue, but disease and death are some, some, something separate. However, in the days of Jesus, they believed that disease was a direct result of a person's sinful life. Thus, they believed that in order to be healed, one must be forgiven of his sins. And they believed that only God had the power to forgive sins. Is that true or not true? Certainly the last part. God it is, is the only one who can forgive sins. It is true. Jesus knew what they were thinking, what their thinking was, and so he took that approach that he did, he took the approach that he did to this young man. The young man himself was most desirous of having his sins forgiven. And when Jesus forgave him, he was content to rest back on his couch, praising God. But Jesus was not finished. To prove that he had the ability to forgive sins, and thus, by implication, was God himself, he not only forgave his sins, but also healed him. Notice that Jesus rewarded the faith of the man who carried the paralyzed, the faith of the men who carried the paralyzed uh, man to Jesus. Whose turn is it? Probably mine, I guess. Mm -hmm. The New Testament contains approximately 30 separate instances of Jesus' healing miracles. In two thirds of these stories, somebody brings somebody else to Jesus. Often physical, mental, emotional, or spiritual healing takes place in the life of another individual because someone cares enough to minister to that person's needs in Jesus' name. Did you notice the words, quote, when Jesus saw their faith, unquote, in Mark 2, 5? This is fascinating. Faith is something you see. It is not something that is intangible. It is always revealed in action, in this instance, Jesus honored the faith of this man's friends. Of course, the man himself must have had a measure of faith by expressing his willingness to have his friends bring him. We can be Jesus' agents of healing as we lead others to Jesus. That comes from Dalton Teachers Sabbath School Study Guide 107. God is always ready to help, and his ear is always open to our cries for help. Myra? The paralytic found in Christ healing for both the soul and the body. The spiritual healing was followed by physical restoration. This lesson should, should not be overlooked. There are today thousands suffering from physical disease who, like the paralytic, are longing for the message, Thy sins are forgiven. The burden of sin with its unrest and unsatisfied desires is the foundation of their maladies. They can find no relief until they come to the healer of the soul. The peace which he alone can give would impart vigor to the mind and health to the body. Desire of Ages, page 271, 270. Okay, Gordon, have you tried taking that approach and saying to the patient, let me pray for you, let me put my hand on you, let's Let's do the right thing first, and then later we'll do everything else for you. I haven't. You haven't. 
Do we need to try that? Perhaps. Perhaps we need to do that with the minister in the room too. Yes. Jesus knew what the Pharisees did not know, that is, that he had the power to heal people from the inside out. Grief, anxiety, discontent, remorse, guilt, distrust, all tend to break down the life forces and to invite decay and death. Ministry of Healing 241. God always seeks to heal the entire person, physically, mentally, socially, and spiritually. He wants us to be restored, ultimately, to the way Adam and Eve were. He wants to restore us into his full image. By contrast, sin destroys. It destroys every aspect of a person's life. We recognize that the root cause of all illness is sin. Sin is a sickness. But Jesus is a complete healer and re a complete health restorer, while Satan is the health destroyer. Accidents happen. It may not be our fault, but we might be very adversely affected. I have some, a couple of young men and a young woman that I take care of that are basically vegetables because of terrible accidents that have happened to them that they were not responsible for in any way. On the other hand, many illnesses are self-imposed. No matter what the cause, God is there to help and he can help. Once again, review the story of Elijah. He was a man who eventually lived a life so close to God that God took him in a fiery chariot to, chariot to heaven. Elijah had the courage to stand up to King Ahab and Queen Jezebel. He trusted God to feed him by the ravens and by the help of the woman of Zarephath. Elijah was able to speak God's word and cause a drought that lasted three and a half years. Surely nothing could shake the faith of someone like that, right? But it happened. And we know the story of what followed. Elijah is now in heaven, celebrating with his Savior, and he is wishing that every one of us could have experience like his experiences. Are we prepared? Let us not make the mistake of being judgmental of people who are sick for one cause or another. The cause of their sickness may be self-imposed, and we may know what it is, but it is not our responsibility to judge and condemn. We are called to bring the gospel to hurting and sin sick world. Sometimes we can bring them to help to them physically and spiritually. On other occasions, we may bring them hope and comfort even though they are dying of some incurable disease. And we can promote, promise them that eternal life is possible to those who place their trust and faith in Jesus. Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, what a privilege it is to have these truths clearly presented before us in Scripture, to know that we can trust you, that we don't need to worry, even if we die, you still have a future plan for our lives. And so may we go forward with new, renewed courage to serve you each day as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.